Anyone else want to confess that you love Jesus as much? Yeah. You love Jesus? Amen. Amen. This weekend was beautiful, has been beautiful, and continues to be beautiful. And I want to just go ahead and let you know that God is going to move on hearts today. He's going to touch your heart. He knows everything that you have need of, and he is not unaware or ignorant to where your heart needs to be touched. And he wants to touch every detail of it, even every tiny thing that you think doesn't matter, matters to him. He cares about it. If it affected your heart, it affects his heart. And you need to know that. We're going to make some time for ministry today for those that did not come this weekend. I want to specifically make sure that you get ministry time. Who has not gotten prayer from Friday or Saturday night? And you have not been here this weekend and it's your first time this morning. Just any of those that apply. You didn't get prayer. It's your first time this morning. Just lift your hands. How many people do we have that need ministry? You like feel like, God, I need ministry. I need God to touch me. Okay. So here's the thing. Because of our time span today, first, we're going to make room. I felt the Holy Spirit, and I always have compassion for moms and dads that come to church, and they're so thankful for this space where their children can go play, and they can just sit and let their heart refresh and resettle. And if your moms and dads in here and your kids are in the nursery or the children's care, we just lift your hand. You have children in the children's care. Just lift your hand. Okay, will you guys make sure to please, when we open up ministry time, would you come forward in the very front on this blue line and let us pray for you first? Those on the blue line, we that it will tell me you're a parent if you're on the blue line. That your kids are in nursery, not just your parents. Let me clarify, because all of you other parents will jump on that real quick. <laughs> if your children are here in child care, because the reason for that is, is they have to pick up their kids at 12. Okay? So we're going to make space for them first to receive ministry. Hallelujah. Amen. Who knows if you give to others, then it shall be given to you. And you give space for other people first, even if you're in desperate need. And you don't rush the front. You let them have their moment. And you're like, God, I'm going to give that space. And you let the parents get prayer. Then they'll go, they'll go get their kids. And then if we're continuing to minister at that time, and the Holy Spirit is still moving, let me explain if the Holy Spirit is still deciding, yes, I want to do another wave, then you'll see us continue to minister and call forward more people. Okay? Now, here's the good news. If you can come back tonight at 6, the entire evening service is dedicated to prayer ministry. We might teach for 5 or 10 minutes just to help your heart understand how to receive, which is very helpful for many people that don't know how to just open up and receive from the Holy Spirit. So we'll probably do a little teaching. And then we're going to dedicate that next two or three hours tonight for you guys to step in. So if you let's let the parents go first this morning. And this is why we've had multiple services. So Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, and Sunday night, out of four meetings, surely everybody can get some form of prayer ministry. Amen? Take your chance and dive into the wave when the Holy Spirit's coming. And what was beautiful about last night is people received deliverance and healing in their broken hearts, just crying and weeping and weeping and freedom all over the place. And we didn't even like hands in the beginning. Who witnessed that? And there was trauma, just pain coming out of our bodies. Guys, sometimes we carry pain in our bodies and we don't realize that it's even something we carry. We just kind of push it down and say, that's fine. I'll shake it off and I'll move on. But the Holy Spirit says, I don't want you just to shake it off and move on. I want you to let my love come and be a balm over that and heal it. Let me be like the knee is foreign over the wounds. Okay, you don't just leave a wound. You take care of it. You let it heal. And you need to medicate it often. And the Holy Spirit is the balm. Amen. And you need to allow him to medicate where the wounds are. And what we're witnessing with the Holy Spirit over this last year that we've seen God move in this special presence of his love is that he comes by his balm and he touches the hearts and we don't even have to, but it's a realm that comes. Does that make sense? And it doesn't just come when I do this to your head. Although he can move that way because he does. And the Holy Spirit doesn't have a formula. 
He's gracious, isn't he? And I asked him, I said, Lord, why is it that sometimes your wave comes and so many people get healing? And then all the people that are just, there's a lot of people that are just sitting and it's like they're waiting for him to heal them, but they don't enter in, even though the anointing is there, it's dropped, you know? It's like you're on a roller coaster. How are you not screaming right now? Kind of mindset is what I'm thinking. Like, how are you not being touched? You're literally in the roller coaster. You should be like all over the place, you know, because we're here, we're on the ride. And people aren't entering in. I said, Lord, why is that? He said, because they've already decided that it's when hands are laid on them that they receive from me. It's a mindset. And he said, they just don't understand. But he said, I want you to, I want you to be gracious and be gentle and kind and don't force them to enter in in a way that they don't understand. And I want you to walk and put your hand on them and they will get free. And so we would sit while we watched a wave of healing and deliverance happen. This is almost every weekend where we've witnessed this. And the Holy Spirit comes and he's like, I want to touch you first. Because first, he wants to be number one. Yes? He wants to be our love and he wants to be our attention. He wants to be our focus. And not the minister who's walking around with the anointing. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I will always back away and give a chance, an invitation for the people to learn to encounter you and your love between them and you so that it won't always be about me being the crutch to get to you, to teach them to walk. Amen? Amen. And this is the heart of the Holy Spirit. And it takes humility for that because you're saying, I don't have it. I don't have it all, but he does. The Holy Spirit has it all, and I don't. I'm only a piece of the body of Christ. I am not the entire body of Christ. But the Holy Spirit is. So you can get more from him than you can from me or the team. But we partner with him in his grace to lay hands on people. It is biblical. If any of you are sick, it says, get the oil. Let the elders of the church anoint him with oil. Let him pray. And the prayer of faith shall raise him up. Prayer of faith will heal him. Yes? So it is biblical to do that. But the Holy Spirit doesn't have rules and regulations and boundaries and limitations. And he can move in a way, he can move upon an entire community just like he did when he opened the Red Sea and delivered every single one of his children over to the promised land by his own hand. He opened the sea, not Moses. Moses just lifted a rod. What did Moses have to do with the water? Nothing. He obeyed. And because he obeyed in humility and lifted his rod, the Lord said, I will deliver my people. He pushed back the sea with his own hands. I can just see him, one hand on the one side, one hand on the other. He opens the sea. And he says, it's me that delivers you. Jehovah Rapha, I am your healer. I am your deliverer. Look to me, says the Lord. And I will set you free. And he pushed back the seat, and they were able to cross over on dry ground, unhurt. Unhurt. Not touched by the storms of the world, storms of this life. We don't have to be touched. We don't have to be hurt. We can be delivered through it. When it should overwhelm us, God can push it back, and there is no more overwhelming. What should stress us out? What should destroy us? What should steal everything and kill us? And crush our spirit doesn't have to do that anymore. Because if you will allow the Holy Spirit to come in and push back the storms in your life, you will come over on dry ground. And this is what he wants to do. This is his heart. This is his love. And this is what we see him do. So we want to create that space for you to heal. The way it is created is it will be created in the atmosphere. It will be created in the spirit. We could have kept on that praise song all morning and gone somewhere. And I would have. But the Holy Spirit has something to say first. And then we can go back onto the next wave. Are you ready? I don't know if you know how to ride tsunami waves. But it's possible. The tsunami wave of the Holy Spirit is here, guys. I know people have been prophesying a wave for a long time. They've been prophesying the wave is coming. And I want you to know that the wave is already here. You're in it. Just don't don't partner with 
the spirit of the world or the spirit of, but I've been in this mess for my whole life. There's no wave. What are you talking about? I'm not in a wave. The thing is, is you are. You are in the wave. You are in the wave, but you've got to partner and agree with the Holy Spirit that you're not going to keep looking at the troubles of this life and you're going to turn your eyes and you're going to look at him because the cross is enough to deliver you. And if it wasn't, God would have sent another savior. If the cross wasn't enough to deliver us, God would have sent another Messiah. Maybe Jesus would have come first and then there would have been another and then there would have been another. But it's always been that way. There actually has been many Messiahs. There's been many saviors. We just don't want to admit it. Jesus hadn't been enough. And so we look to this anointed person and this anointed person and this anointed person to become our savior. And there has been many Christs. But Jesus said, don't, don't look to that. Don't, don't go when they say Christ is here, Christ is there. Here he is, there he is. He said, don't look at that. He said, I am the one. He said, you'll know when I come. There'll be lightning as far as the east is from the west. There'll be thunder. There'll be flashes of light. There will be no doubt when the Son of Man shows up. And there should be no doubt now when he shows up. He said, there is no other foundation that can be laid but that of Jesus Christ. He also warned us, be careful how you build upon this foundation. Be careful how you build upon this foundation. And every time the church begins to build a false temple that God never wanted to be built, he destroys it. If we think we're getting closer to God and we're building our own towers like they did with the Tower of Babel, they said, we'll go to heaven on our own. Well, there's a teaching nowadays that's teaching people how to go to heaven on their own. You know, come out of your body and go to heaven and excel and ascend into the heights. Ascend into heaven. I'm like, why do you need to ascend into heaven? The Bible says Christ came down to earth. It also says you can't ascend or descend into the depths of hell to escape him. So why is it that you need to go to heaven to find him when he's actually in the earth, in heaven, and in hell? The presence of God is in hell. Why are we trying to go somewhere else to find Jesus? Jesus is right here in my heart. And it makes the Holy Spirit angry that people are trying to obtain some glory or revelation or leveling up in the spirit or something. As if Christ didn't do enough already. It is a mockery in the face of God. God will not be mocked. There is nothing higher than his son. Nothing higher than his son. His son has already been lifted up to the highest place. And anyone that looks at him, the highest one, the most high, say most high. Most high. You can't go higher than him, friend. Stop trying. Because he already humbled himself and came lower. You didn't have to climb to him. He came to you. Because he's a humble king. Didn't we sing about it? You're a humble king. He came to me. I don't need to go after him. I don't need to search him. He found me when I was lost. He found me. He came to me when I wasn't seeking for him. Do you understand? And now I think I'm going to continue in my righteousness and continue in the anointing and continue my walk with him after 20 years by seeking and obtaining something greater because now I have to excel. It was never a requirement in the beginning. He said, only believe and you'll see the glory of God. He said, believe in me. Therefore, you shall be made a new creation. All things are passed away. All things have become new. This is the gospel. Anything else being built upon that revelation needs to be torn down. Tear it down out of your mind. Get those books out of your house that talks about accelerating. Get it out of your house. How to get more of God. How to do
do this, how to do that, how to get it all out. I'm telling you right now, Jesus never wanted us to approach him that way. He always wanted us to approach by faith. And no book can give you that. No book. Except the hearing of the gospel message. The true gospel message creates faith in you because it resonates in your spirit. This is truth. This is truth. This is truth. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Any other teaching needs to come down. Friend, it doesn't matter if it's the most anointed speaker in the world and the highest platform. If they are not preaching the gospel of Christ, you should not be listening to them. I don't care who they are. God bless them. I pray they get a revelation that he is the revelation. I pray they get a revelation. Jesus is the revelation. The church has been trying to build upon the revelation of Christ ever since. Ever since. There is no more to obtain. Jesus has obtained the keys to death, hell, and the grave. There is no more thing to obtain. Jesus obtained it all. You don't obtain anything. Jesus owns it. He owns the earth. He owns the heaven. Even all of his enemies are under his feet. He owns everything. There is no reason. He doesn't need us to fight anything except standing in faith on what he has already done through the power of the cross. Through the blood of Jesus is enough. And it needs to be preached to us until it's a resounding sound in our spirit that we really agree with. The cross is enough for me to be free. The cross is enough for me to heal. Jesus already made the way and provided for me the way out of this bondage, of this hurt, of this pain. And he showed it to me by his precious love when he gave his life. And the father displayed his love towards us by giving his only son. And we don't need another act of revelation. I don't need another act of glory revelation. I don't need to ascend into the heavens. I don't need to talk to the angels. I don't need that. Amen. If we need that, we've missed the revelation of Christ. Amen. Do you hear me? I pray, and Paul prayed this because he understood it, because Christ himself stood in front of Paul. And he opened his eyes, and he saw him, and then he feared the Lord. Who are you? His eyes were open. He saw the glory of the living Christ. Who are you? I'm the one you're persecuting. I feel like this is still happening today. And what we need is the glory of God to come and open the eyes of our understanding so we can see the entire time we've actually been persecuting Jesus because we haven't received what he paid the price for by allowing him to set us free. We're persecuting him because we're judging the church, we're criticizing each other, we're not loving each other, and we're crucifying him again on the cross. But we don't see it. Why? Because we've allowed ourselves these permissions of this is how it is. This is how it goes. But the preaching of the gospel will cut that root and bring truth again and reground you into the love of Christ, which is where everything should be built from. If you've built your life and your house on anything but the love of Christ, loving him, loving others, forgiving people, not allowing bitterness in your heart, learning to serve others and give your life up for others. This is the gospel. If we're not living that way, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. I know I did it for a long time, even as a minister grieved the Holy Spirit because I wasn't truly dead to my flesh. I know what the struggle is, I know what the battle is, and I know when the Holy Spirit is crying out to us, please, please let your flesh die so that you might live. He wants us to live. His voice is cheering us on and wanting to heal us and wanting us to live so that we can step into the actual resurrection power of Jesus and live with him. He wants to raise us up and sit together with him in the heavenly places. But friend, those seats are not just for anyone. They're for the ones that actually made him God. You can't just say, yeah, Jesus is my Lord, and then do your own thing. This is not the truth. This is not the gospel. You can't just say that. Everyone listening, please. Everyone listening. Listen to my words. 
Let's respect the word of the Lord when it's being preached. The gospel is the truth. If you're not obeying what Jesus Christ said in the Bible, you are in mockery and disobedience to the Lord. It's called rebellion, and you will be judged forever in hell. And you're not above the glory of God. There needs to be humility in our hearts that we respect and honor him above. And there has been a spirit of mockery unleashed in this next generation that is entitled and thinks it doesn't have to submit, right? Doesn't have to submit to authority. Jesus warned us in the, in the Bible that in the last days that children will become disobedient to parents. And if we've ever seen a disobedient way, it's been now. That they would become disobedient they would not humble themselves. No one talking, please. They would not humble themselves. They would not humble themselves. And there's an entitlement. And it's a spirit of pride. And it's the same thing that got Lucifer cast out of heaven. And I'm trying to help people. That spirit will separate you from Jesus forever. Forever. If you can't respect Jesus and respect the anointing, respect the anointing, respect it. What happened to the fear of God when we show up in church? That this is the place where we meet. This is the place where we meet with him face to face and we don't fear him anymore. And we're like, okay, God, do something for my life. What is that mess? Jesus didn't do anything for your life already? He didn't do enough when he died and was crucified and suffered the most horrible, painful death of all history. That wasn't enough for you. That wasn't enough for you. Now God has to do more for you. He shouldn't have to do one more thing. Because what he did through the cross is the very root and foundational power of the seed that we need so that we can actually step into healing, Physically, emotionally, deliverance, and the blessings of God. All of it comes from the cross. All of it. The Bible says, except the Lord build the house. I need 65 degrees. Don't worry. It's up here, not back there. I won't freeze you guys, but I'm wearing a sweatshirt or a dark horse sweatshirt. Hello. And this is hot. Do not preach in sweatshirts. <laughs> Note to self. Add that to the notes. Do not preach in sweatshirts. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. They have a separate air conditioning up here so I can freeze and you guys don't have to. <laughs> Jesus did enough. The Bible says, except the Lord build the house. Those that labor, labor in vain. And we come week after week and we're laboring and we're laboring and we're laboring. Because we're trying to rescue ourselves. Do you hear me? You're not your rescuer, and you need to give up that position. You can be a mess, and you can come into church, and you can let your heart be a mess with God, and you can come up to this blue line. And this is how the Lord taught me that how to actually receive from Him and get healed. Okay? So the Holy Spirit's moving, and I'm like, I'm a mess, and I need help. Here I come. <laughs> right? Is this? Is anybody do that, or is it just me? Okay. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Here I am, but I'm a mess. And then I stand there on the line, ashamed. I'll turn this way. I'm facing, you know, the Lord. And I'm here's how I face him. I'm coming for help, but I'm doing it like this. I'm so unworthy. I know I shouldn't be standing here right now. You're not gonna touch me. I don't deserve it. I'm unworthy of this. I'm so horrible. Why can't I get free? What are these cycles gonna stop? What is wrong with me? Why can't I just get free? What do I need to do something? What is wrong? Uh, and the whole thing is about me and what I've done and what I need to do. Does this sound familiar, this dialogue? Amen. And the Holy Spirit had to overwhelm me, take me over, come upon my body to where I could not stand his love anymore and spoke into my spirit and said, you're grieving me when you do that. You're looking to yourself, and I want you to look to me. He said, lift your face now and look at me. In all your condemnation and all your shame, he said, lift it up. 
look at me right now. Look at me in the eyes. And I looked at him and he said, my son paid the price to set you free and does not expect you to make yourself free. And the revelation of that filled my entire being until I finally understood my efforts were not required except to receive the gift that had been given to me of freedom through the cross of Christ. And he said the enemy's plan is to make you feel condemned and unworthy and ashamed so that instead of doing this and saying, thank you, Jesus, that you made the way and now I can come in, even though I'm not there yet, I'm coming in. You've opened the door and I'm going to come through it. Thank you, Jesus. I praise you. I praise you. I praise you. I know it's going to happen, Lord, because you are good. And instead of that, condemnation tells you, no, you can't do that. And it makes you turn away and say, sorry, Lord, I can't. I can't. And makes you stay separated from the Lord. He said, this is the enemy's plan. That's why condemnation and shame is the number one tactic of the enemy during any ministry time. Because if he can make you feel ashamed and condemned for your life, you will never open up and realize that God forgives you. God wants to heal you. God loves you. Jesus wants to come in that moment and hold you. And does not blame you. Even if you've sinned 50,000 times and keep going back in the cycles. The revelation that you need is he is the only one that has the power to break the cycle. He is the only one. Not you. Not you. You can speak all day long. I break the cycle. I break the cycle. And there is power to our words. But unless you receive the power that breaks the cycle, you might have agreed with your words, I break the cycles, I break the curses, I break the generational curses. You might have done that, but there is a response to that breaking with your words. There's a response to that covenant where the Holy Spirit says, and now the power of my Holy Spirit can come on you and actually remove the things that have been in your life that were causing the cycles. The power of the blood is the only breaker do you hear me? And you have to fully receive that power. Not just a piece of it. Fully receive it. So that you can be free. Somebody needs to preach the gospel. Pastor Kurt, I need to preach the gospel. They're my uncle and aunt. You're welcome to come here if you don't have a church home. Many people have made this a church home that follow us in our ministry. And they preach the gospel, and they move in deliverance, and they see trauma healing, and it's a beautiful place in the Lord's heart where you can receive healing. Amen? Yeah. So there's a movement right now of people that preach the true gospel. I told y'all I need help. Remember when I cried I needed help? I need help opening water bottles. See, I even humble myself to needing a lid taken off for me. I preached that last night. I needed a team and I needed help because I was always alone. And I cried out to God, I need a team. I can't love all your people. The overwhelmingness of the people's needs is what it started with. I was like, there's so many people and they're all broken and there's one of me and there's 500 people and I don't know how I'm going to do this. It says I'll just physically just wear out, but that's okay. I'll wear out and I'll die early if I need to. That's fine. I don't care. I give you my life. And I was like, but I would like a team. I would, I would like help. And God sent me help. He cares about your water bottle being open. That's just one of the many facets that my sis Rachel carries is compassion and love and servant heartedness and washes the saints' feet and has wisdom poured out of her mouth like liquid gold. But that's a story for another time. Did anybody come to the school yesterday? Did you enjoy hearing from the rest of the team? Are they amazing or what? And together we make a great team. The fullness of the body is a beautiful picture of how every member has to play their part and not every person has the entirety of what Jesus contains. And if we humble ourselves and say, I actually need other people, you would do yourself a favor. And stop trying to find it all in yourself. You need community. You need family. You need love. Don't isolate. 
find friends, come to church, make it happen. Don't let the enemy get you in offense and make you back off from people and be isolated and criticize and judge and get hurt by things they say. Find the lower road, find love, find humility, find servant heartedness. And when you get filled with love enough, do you know the church won't offend you anymore? If you have church hurt, guys, you haven't been filled with love all the way. There should be no more church hurt. There shouldn't be any more, I'm not going to church because they hurt me 20 years ago. That's unforgiveness and bitterness, and God realizes his church needs help. That's why the Holy Spirit was sent when Jesus ascended on high. He said, I'm going to go because it's better. Even Jesus humbled himself and said, I need help from the helper. He's like, wait, I can't do this whole thing. I've got to send you another. Hello. The Son of God humbled himself to the ability of the Holy Spirit to come on the earth. We can learn something. The Son of God humbled himself to let 70 of his disciples go out and cast out demons. He didn't think that he was the end of the show. But stops here. He didn't have this attitude. He said, no, I want my kingdom to multiply. And it doesn't have to be me that does it because my children's heart matters. And their brokenness matters. And the only way we're going to be able to do this and see that my father's kingdom come is if I spread myself into every person and they go and set the captive free. It's the only way it's going to happen. And he humbled himself to that way. That's true humility, that I'm not the end all. I'm not the end anointing. I'm not the most gifted one in the room. I'm not, no. We've got to lay all this at the feet of Jesus. He's the anointing. He's the revelation. The Holy Spirit's the most gifted one in the room. And unless the Holy Spirit allows something and allows gifts and anointing on you anyways, it's not, you're not the source of it. You can't turn it on and you can't turn it off. And I want to tell you something. We have to understand the Holy Spirit's been given to us. When Jesus said, I'm sitting up on high, it's better for me to go away so that I can send another. I'm going to send the comforter. And he will lead you and guide you into all truth. He talks about the comforter and he talks about the Holy Spirit and calls him things like he will help you. He's the helper. He will lead you. He will guide you into all truth. He is with you. He is with you. He is with you. I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Jesus said, I don't leave you alone. I'm not leaving you alone. Stop thinking you're alone. Stop thinking he's far away up there in heaven, that Jesus is so far away from you, and you just can't wait till you can go to heaven so you can actually be with Jesus. You have a wrong revelation. Jesus is here now by his spirit. The spirit of Christ is here. Jesus is literally in this room. He may not be here in his physical, spiritual body. I know that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, but I want to tell you his spirit is extended into all the universe. He sees. His eye is all-knowing. He, he sees everywhere. He can see everything. Omnipresent. Omniscient. Omniscient. Omnipotent. Those are all the fun words to say. Especially when you're filled with the Holy Ghost and your tongue doesn't work. <laughs> because the body can't contain the power of God. When the power of God comes, your body starts losing its ability to function. It's a real thing. And if you haven't gotten to the point where you start losing the ability to function a little bit, you need to just drink a little more. Because it's so good. It's the best wine you'll ever have. Lord, I need help. I sent you the Holy Ghost. Why aren't you drinking from him? I told you he'd be a well in you of living water that would spring up into everlasting life. Why aren't you letting the river flow? He's like, I did it. I paid the price through the cross for you to have everything you need. Why are you still begging me? And this is what I was doing when I would come up front. Oh, God, please help me. Please help me. Please help me. He's like, I already did everything. What needed to happen was a revelation. Even though I didn't see my circumstance change, I realized my partnership with agreeing with truth was broken. And because of my own belief, it was being done unto me. My own belief was causing an existence that didn't have to be, that Jesus made a way for to be free from. All it was, all for me was a change, a mindset change, a revelation by the Spirit, where the Holy Spirit came upon me. It wasn't even me, because I used to beg him for 10, 20 years with this kind of mindset and could never enter into the Holy Spirit because I would spend two hours traveling for myself <laughs> and interceding and trying to break off all the demons off of me. And asking God to heal my heart and spending two or three hours screaming, begging, crying, never getting anywhere. 
And you would think God would answer that. No, he doesn't answer faithlessness. That was no faith. No faith at all. Because he said, those that believe, those that believe in my name will heal the sick, cast out devils, speak with their tongues, raise the dead. If we truly believe the power of God will move through us, if the power of God is not moving through us, there is a mindset change that must happen. And you need the revelation of Christ being the cornerstone. You need a revelation. It is finished. When he said it's finished, it was finished, and it is finished for all time. Amen. It is finished. Yes. No amount of your efforts is ever going to take you into breakthrough. None. I don't care if you pray all day. I don't care if you fast all day. I don't care if you've memorized the entire Bible. None of that is going to help you unless you invite the helper. Do you hear me? Your reading the Bible all day is not making him want to help you more. You fasting 40 days is not moving the arm of God to help you more. You know how I know this? Jesus tells us a story in the Bible. How much time do I have? I'm almost there. I didn't preach any of my message. Way to go. Who came in here and changed my message by your belly? Who did it? Confess up right now. Who needed this message right now? Go ahead and confess. I see all of you coming for you right now. I'm going to pray and lay hands on you. That's it. You're going to pay for this. With the power of the Holy Ghost. He knows what you have need of, see? And he pulls it out of my belly. What did I just say before that? Before I said how much time I have, what did I just say? Who's listening? You can fast for 40 days. How do I know that? And it doesn't help you? Well, I'm going to help some people get you free of religious law right now. And I'm going to preach for five more minutes because i got something to say. Because I got delivered. And thank God I got delivered. Because I lived in that law mindset. I lived in that religious spirit of works mentality to approach God and get God's favor. Blah! Like my efforts are better than Jesus's. Disgusting. Is it wrong to pray and fast? No, I fasted. I just do it sometimes because I'm not hungry. I'm just hungry for him. I'm not doing it to get somewhere. I'm not doing it to get anointed. But how do I know biblically that this is true what I'm saying? Because everything needs to be based on the word of God. Jesus tells us a story. He's sitting there and there's two men. One of them is a Pharisee who's obeyed the law all his life. He looks up to heaven and he says, Oh Lord, I fast twice a week. I give all my alms to the poor. So he's a notifying heaven how amazing he is with his efforts. Yes. And this is why you should accept me, Lord. This is his attitude. Pride. Then there's another man. Jesus looks at him. He's on his knees, would not even lift his face to heaven, and he's beating his chest. And he's saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus looks at his followers and all the people listening and his disciples, and he says, I tell you right now, it's this man who is justified before God. The one who humbles himself and realizes help comes from God. Not from fasting, not from prayer, not from memorizing scripture, not from all the ways you give to the poor. Does not earn you special places for God's anointing or in heaven. You don't get special things. If when you put your pride of self-exaltation in what you're doing, that's supposed to be an act of sacrifice and love for others, but you grab it and say, I did this, 
There's nothing wrong with giving to the poor in a spirit of humility. There's nothing wrong with doing things when there is a humble way of coming. And humility says, I'm not the way, I'm not the source, you are. And even if we give to the poor, we understand he gave us the gift to give to the poor. And when we start thinking we're the source of things, we've missed it. Because the Bible actually tells us he gives seed to the sower. Amen. It doesn't say you obtain seed. You're wrong in thinking you obtained your, your income. You obtained your money. You obtained anything given to you. You're absolutely wrong. Nothing you have comes from you. Every good thing that you have comes from the Father above. It tells us in the scripture, every good thing comes down from the Father above. And when you understand this and you start finally getting a revelation that God actually wanted to take care of his children, serve his children, provide for his children, and he wants them to come home with him, you will open your heart and give yourself permission to heal and be loved and know that God is with you and he's going to walk with you and everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. So don't base your life off of law and works. That's what this message is about today. Even showing up on Sunday morning church, guys, it's not an entrance into, into heaven. You can never go to church for the rest of your life and still make it to heaven if you love God and love others. Church is not a requirement to be saved. Do you hear me? Church is not a requirement to be saved. And you are not to feel pressed. In any way, by a religious spirit, it's in the atmosphere that tries to talk to you. If you don't go to church, something's wrong with you. If you don't go to church, you're backslidden. We should want to go to church. It's community and love, but it is not a law. Do you hear me? It's not a law. You can gather with believers in your home, love Jesus, worship Jesus, and that's having church. You need community. You need community. So come to a church building, gather in a home, whatever you do, you need community, you need love, because this is how we heal. And it's humbling ourselves to God's way, saying, I need someone else in the body of Christ so that I can feel whole. And realizing how beautiful that is when we see that. Don't let a law rule you. I want to say this. Matthew 9, verse 9, and I'm finishing up, and if if the band wants to come up and get situated and get ready, and we're going to step into um, the song you did right before the last song. No one like you. No one like our king, something like that. Do you know what I'm talking about? She knows. She's got it. I want you guys to prepare your heart. We're going to step into ministry. Time. And just because I said parents first doesn't mean people you can't stand and worship God and receive in your seats or stand and receive right where you are. You're not, you're not left out, okay? Amen? Because there's more than enough. Is there more than enough? Is there 12 baskets left over after feeding 15,000 people? Okay, you can eat. You can eat today. You can drink today. Matthew 9, 9 says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. Now, this is Matthew, who was basically, I guess, would be considered a sinner. They hated tax collectors. I know that. And so he's looking at him and he's not saying, you're too dirty. Don't follow me. You're too ashamed. Don't follow me. You know, or I condemn you. Don't follow me. He's like, I don't care where you're at right now. You're in the middle of. You're in the middle of it, literally collecting money in a prideful heart. He's collecting, probably just collected from someone, and Jesus is talking to him, and he's collecting money. What? Follow you? Why would I do that? I'm making money. Jesus didn't seem to care that the man, Matthew, did not have the revelation of who he is. He's still going to say, follow me. Because he's a humble king. And he's not like, do you not know who I am? He does not approach us that way. He's like, follow me. Give me your hand. Let me help you. Let me help you out of this. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Come with me. Follow me. Let me give you life. 
He's asking you that this morning. If you're in the middle of sin, if you're in the middle of walking a path of sin away from the Lord, all Jesus is saying to you is follow me. Follow me. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Looks to me like Jesus never made anyone feel lower. There was not a comment come out of his mouth. There was not a look in his eye that looked down upon them and made them feel ashamed or condemned because they felt so much permission to come sit at a table with him and eat. Do you hear me? You have permission to come sit at the table this morning. In the midst of your brokenness, you have permission. The religious spirit accuses Jesus. And this is what the religious spirit will try to say to you. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why do you eat with sinners? Why would Jesus eat with a sinner? Why would Jesus eat with a sinner? This is the voice of a demonic spirit and not God. chose to eat with sinners. He chose. Jesus did. He walked into the house. He chose to sit down. And he chose to love. On hearing this, Jesus replies, and I'm going to end with this. And I want you to stand up right now. Go ahead and stand up right now. And I want you to hear this from the heart of Jesus right now. And be ready to receive. Those of you that are parents that have your children in child care, would you go ahead and make your way towards the front and just be ready to receive? Just go ahead and make your way. You're not going to distract anyone. Go ahead and make your way towards the front and stand on the blue line. And I want you to hear this with all of your heart. Jesus is going to speak this to you right now. You need to hear it because I heard it echoing in my heart this morning. And I know it's his voice. Make your way up. Make your way up. You have time. Why would Jesus eat with a sinner? Why would he eat with a sinner? Why does he not see what kind of woman this, this is? In another situation, the Pharisees accused a woman for worshiping him because he had set her free and forgiven, forgiven her. And she worshiped him and poured out everything. And they're like, why, why? What? They're accusing. This is what the religious spirit does. It accuses you, condemns you, it shames you. You can't love Jesus like that. You didn't follow the law. You haven't done what we've done. You haven't fasted twice a week. You don't deserve this. The Messiah said to us, we deserve. The Lord says no one deserves. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. Not one of us has not sinned. Not one. <clears throat> Why would Jesus eat with a sinner? Jesus hears this. And he replies. It is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. It's not those that are good. It's not those that are perfect that need Jesus, but those who are broken. Close your eyes all over this place. Let the Holy Spirit touch you. Don't look at me, I'm not the source. I know I'm talking, but I want you to hear my voice and I want you to look at his face. Look at his face right now. He said, I didn't come. I didn't come for the healthy. I didn't come for the righteous. I came to make the unrighteous righteous. I came for the sick. I came for the poor. I came for the broken. I came to make them new. I came to make them a new creation. I came for this purpose, for this purpose, to make you new and to bring you into my kingdom. Holy Spirit, everywhere right now, where there's been brokenness, bring your mercy. It is not the healthy you need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He doesn't desire your efforts. He doesn't desire 
You're wailing at how bad you are at him. He doesn't desire your begging and pleading of how horrible of a person you are at his altar. He doesn't desire your sacrifice. He doesn't desire your fasting and your praying and your repetitions and your acts of service to him. He doesn't desire it. He desires to give you mercy. And if we could just go into that song and begin to sing and just ride the wave and stay on that place when we hit that chorus and just stay on that rhythm and repeat it and just stay there and go back and forth with that rhythm. The Holy Spirit's going to come and hover over you as they go into the song. And we're going to come and minister to those standing up front and there's going to be anointing coming. So I want you to open your heart right now. It's not about what's in you and what you've done. It's about Him and what He's done. Lift your face to the living King. Lift your face to the one who shed his blood to you and allow what he did to wash you. Right now. Right now. Just go ahead and start, guys. Go ahead and start the song. It's okay if I'm talking. Just go ahead. Take us up. Take us up. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners.
that here at 6 o'clock. If you need freedom, if you need your heart touched, please come back if you can. If you cannot come back at all, would you just lift your hands right now if you cannot come back tonight? You cannot come back. If there's a few of you that cannot come back and you desperately want prayer, I'm not saying like, oh yeah, I can use prayer. Not that kind. If you're like, I've got to have prayer, that's what I'm looking for. If you're like, oh yeah, that'd be fine, I want prayer. But if you desperately need prayer and you cannot come back, would you just come right here? Just come right here. And we're going to take a few minutes with these people. And the rest of you, if you wouldn't mind waiting, if you can come back at six, because there's so many people. We want everyone to get deep freedom. You understand? So if we try to take everybody in one meeting, we can't. We can't get to everyone. And then we have to pray quickly and go move on so we can pray for one. We don't want to have to do that. We're going to be able to wait with you in the presence of God as he's pulling pain out of your body. And it's a beautiful thing, and I never want to rush the Holy Spirit. Amen? So if you need deliverance, and there's layers, or you need healing, or you've been through a lot of trauma, I want you to know there's an anointing on this ministry to heal deep trauma, even from the earliest memories, the earliest childhood, even from the womb, I've seen God do deliverance. If you cannot come back tonight, come up here. If you can come back tonight, just please wait. I'm asking for mercy. It's not that we don't want to pray for you, it's we want to pray for you. Do you understand? Okay. We want you to have. We didn't come this far for you to just be a little nice blessing. We want you to have a deep ministry. Tonight, 6 o'clock, we'll be back here. I'm going to teach maybe 5 or 10 minutes. And we're going to go straight into hours of time to receive. Okay? Amen. I'm going to let Pastor Harold just say something. And God bless you guys. See you tonight. If you have freedom to stay here in the presence, but you also have the freedom to be quietly and just, if you want to spend time with people out in the lottery, that's awesome, but we'd like to keep this space in the attitude that it is. If you are free to go, look forward to seeing you back this evening at 6 o'clock. Be blessed.